I'd like to welcome everybody and call to order tonight's Board of Education meeting, February 27th, 2024. Standing as you are able, could you uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance as led by Treasurer Gerby? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Cherie Mademoiselle, it is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that we welcome you tonight. And now, we invite you to relax. Let us pull up a chair as the dining room proudly presents your dinner. Be our guest, be our guest, put our service to the test. Tie your napkin around your neck, Cherie, and we'll provide the rest. Soup de jour, hot hors d'oeuvre, so why we only live to serve. Try the gray stuff, it's delicious. Don't believe me? Ask the dishes. They can sing, they can dance. After all, miss, this is France. And this dinner here is never second best. Go on, unfold your menu, take a glance, and then you'll be our guest. Be our guest, be our guest. Be fragu, cheese souffle, pie and pudding en flambe. We'll prepare and serve with flair and culinary cabaret. You're alone and you're scared, but the banquet's been prepared. No one's gloomy or complaining, while well, the flatware's entertaining. We tell jokes, I do tricks with my fellow candlesticks. And it's all in perfect taste that you can bet. Come on and lift your glass, you've won your own free pass to be our guest. We are our guest, be our guest. I'm just gonna grab. Well, and thank you, thank you very much. The SHS Drama Club, under the direction of Ms. Glatz, we're really looking forward to the um, three upcoming performances of Beauty and the Beast. It'll take place on the weekend of March 15th through the 17th, all taking place at the Ellen Ewing Performing Arts Center. But it's a cashless event, so ticket purchases will be online only and can be made in advance. There's a link to purchase tickets coming out soon. And they can also be purchased online at the door on the day of the performance. I'm going Friday night, so I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for, thanks for entertaining us tonight. But I'm going Friday night, too. Oh, you're going Friday night, too? Great. Thank, thank you so much. I've been hoping to be able to do something like this for the past year and a half. Thank you. We have uh, superintendents has, would like to recognize a few uh, special people in this district. Okay, so our first uh, recognition tonight is the Celine Volleyball Program. And many, if not all, are at uh, club volleyball tonight. So we went over earlier today and had a picture taken with myself, um, athletic director, Mantha, and uh, many of the girls that make up the team. And so I'd like to acknowledge the Celine Varsity Volleyball teams from the past two seasons. We we'll backtrack to 2022 as it was the best season Celine Varsity Volleyball has had in 38 years. The 2022 season was coached by Darian Bandel and Jamison Cruz, and the season brought many championships and honors, including first place in the SEC Red, district champions, regional champions, elite eight champs, and they made it all the way to the final four in Battle Creek. One senior, Laney Burns, continues to play volleyball in college at Edinburgh University. Now on to this past season, the 2023 season was also coached by Darian and Jamison, and the team was led by five seniors, along with six juniors and five sophomores, and they saw tremendous improvement throughout the season. They took second place in the SEC Red. They were district champions and made it to the Sweet 16 in the regional finals. Six players earned all-conference honors, including first team, Olivia Bien. Mallory Bull, Catherine Flaherty, Marie Lorio, and honorable mention Kate Fredericks and Allie Smith. Two players earned all region and all state honors. Marie Lorio, second team all state, and Olivia Bean, all state honorable mention. Three seniors have committed to play volleyball and further their education in college, including Olivia Bean at Grand Valley, Mallory Bull at Notre Dame, Catherine Flaherty at Xavier, 
and junior Marie Lario is going to Syracuse, but she still has one more year to play as a Celine Hornet. And the varsity team wants to also recognize the freshman and JV teams as their support and cheering were vital to their success. Thank you to all the younger players as well as freshman coach Stephanie DeVee and JV coach Ellen Stoltz. The future of Celine Volleyball is bright, sting them. And now on to our next superintendent recognition, and that includes the SHS Today and Hornet Nation, um, our, our teachers involved in that program, and the students. It's a wonderful program. So we'll start with reading a little bit about their accomplishments. The video news production program taught by Mr. Nathan Bush creates weekly news shows, SHS Today and Hornet Nation for Selene High School in the local community. SHS Today, a magazine-style news show, is in its 15th year and features stories about interesting happenings around Celine High School. Hornet Nation is celebrating its 10th season as it showcases the best of Hornet's athletic programs. This year, the teams have produced a combined 18 shows for the season. The year started with second-year students helping to lead first-year students towards being knowledgeable on the production process and technology required to pull off the various aspects of news production. By mid-November, the first shows debuted during Wednesday's Hornet time and have continued since. In addition to the weekly show production schedule, both teams have been producing the advertising videos for the 22 different SWWC programs that will be showcased throughout Washtenaw County over the course of the next year and a half. These videos provide every student a real-world opportunity to work with a client AKA the program teacher, to create a high quality promotional video that showcases each unique program offered through the SWWC. But probably the most fun was had on two video news production field trips to Detroit this year. In November, students had a chance to go to Ford Field and experience the Michigan Association of Broadcasting Great Lakes Broadcast and Sports Media Academy. They met industry professionals in breakout sessions and learned from keynote speaker, Detroit Tiger broadcaster, Craig Monroe. And just earlier this month, the team headed back to Detroit to visit the awesome media house at Rock Financial and had a behind the scenes tour of WDIV studios with news anchor and reporter, Nick Monticelli. They even made it on a live news broadcast at noon. As you can tell, it's been a great season so far. So we'd like to have Hornet Nation and SHS Today. Everybody come up to the microphone. We'll go one at a time and you state your role, what year you are in school, and then tell us what, you're, um, what, yeah, what you do um, for either SHS Today or Hornet Nation. Let's start with uh, our, our, our Mr. Nathan Bush. Let's begin with that and then everybody come up and then we're gonna take a picture over on the side. And oh, you have to toggle the microphone on by clicking the push button to make it green. All right. Thank you very much. And Ben, I just sent you a text if you want to showcase that. Uh, my name is Nathan Bush, and thank you very much for the honor. Uh, these are some of the student representatives, come on up, um, that ha are part of the video news production program here for us this year. And I'm having like a full circle moment as my son is also Lumiere. So I wanted to point that out, which is fun for me. So thank you for tying this all together. This is great. So anyway, come on up. So I'm Brady Noctreve. I'm a senior uh, producer for Hornet Nation this year. Uh, this is my second year doing the program, and this year has been such a wonderful opportunity to get to really leave a legacy for these like first-year students and people who are really interested in the industry. The trips we've been on, these experiences that we've actually got to be like hands-on in the industry have been really impactful, and I'm really excited to go maybe do something with that in the future. I'm going into like a graphic design kind of field, but a lot of video does come from that and like is needed in the industry. So there is always video needed everywhere. So it's been just an honor. My name is Nick Roman. I'm a junior and a second year student in the program. I, uh, I'm going to be a third year next year. And so I'm just excited to continue the work that we do and, and, you know, pursue, pursue a future in the field. 
Hi, I'm Faith Pearson. I'm a second year and I'm the producer. I'm one of the producers of SHS Today. Along with what Brady said, I've learned so much in this class from last year and this year. This year being in a more leadership position, so I get to teach people as I go. And it truly is just a great class, led by an incredible teacher. And yeah, it's I've had so much fun and all the opportunities that I've been given in are amazing. Hello, my name is Ev Belote. I have been in SHS today. This is my first year. I'm a junior, and I can't wait to come back next year and have more fun. eventually, Rhonda. I know. I think a couple of them are ready to take our seats. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learned a few things here and what an awesome group from St. I love SHS today when it, uh, every time it comes on, I get the little email from uh, Nate Bush. I'm, I, I just drop everything and I say, well, all right, let's see what do they got going on this time. It's and it's, it, it's must watch TV. Really must good. watch TV. Uh, we're at the public comment section. A uh, member of the public can address the, pub, uh, the board briefly for up to three minutes or request to be scheduled on the agenda of a future meeting. Please note that students will be given priority to speak on any topic. The first public participation portion of the meeting will be limited to one half hour, 30 minutes normally, and limited to agenda items only. A second public participation portion will be offered at the end to allow for any other comment. Individuals addressing the board should take into consideration the rules of common courtesy, public participation portion of the meeting cannot be used to make personal attacks against the board member, district employee, or student. We have one stakeholder who wishes to speak this evening. <clears throat> and we got a new person on the timer, you know, give them a few seconds to get. No, oh, now it is. I am Corey Belote, and I am speaking to you tonight on behalf of the Celine Lacrosse Program. I am the board president of the High School Boys Lacrosse Club and wanted to let you know that sign up is open for third through eighth grade through community ed. The third through eighth grade parent guardian meeting is March 13th at 5.30 p.m. in the Liberty School Cafeteria. High school registration is open. It's under self-funded sports lacrosse where you'll find both boys and girls lacrosse. Boys lacrosse starts Tuesday, March 12th from 6 to 8 at, 6 to 8 at Hornet Stadium. We'll ha be holding practice and tryouts at the same time. Uh, the high school parent guardian meeting is Tuesday, March 19th at 7 p.m. in the high school commons. We are a self-funded sport. That means that we are fully funded by our player fees and fundraising. And we do hope to become a school-funded sport someday. Our player fee is $400. We offer financial need-based scholarships, and it's a wonderful sport. By far, it's my favorite sport to watch. My oldest started playing in fifth grade, and he is in his second year at Hope College playing lacrosse there. My youngest started in third grade, and he will be playing goalie as a junior. 
So if you're looking to try out the game, check us out. Again, third through eighth grade, register through Community Ed. High school, join us on March 12th at 6 p.m. And if you've never played before, come check us out. We do have equipment for loan. We're happy to teach you, introduce you to the wonderful sport. And lastly, I do want to give a shout out to the Beauty and the Beast cast. I have a kid in the cast. Um, as well as they were also in, are also in Hornet Nation, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have no response to uh, previous <coughs> public comment. At this point, uh, it's the revisions or approval of the agenda, and I know that there are a couple of issues going up. I'll, I'll start with mine. Uh, I'd like to remove item seven. Uh, the student showcase is canceled this evening, and um, are there any other changes to the agenda that we need to take into account? Um, maybe, I mean, it's not a big one, but I, I know that Jenny's not here, mm -hmm. and for the policy update, Oh, uh, she she left me a lot of notes. I'm prepared to make a policy. Update. Okay, yeah, she it just had her name there, so I just oh, wanted to. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. if you if you think it would be better with okay. my name there, that's fine. I'll be her designee. Yeah. There, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I thought you wanted to table that one item. Oh yeah, are we moving to that? I didn't no, we're we're tabling or changing. We're adjusting the uh, agenda at this point. Your mic needs to be on. So I was hoping to um, move the bench discussion to a later date and possibly form an ad hoc committee. Is that what we decided? Or take it to the wellness committee? Super, thank you. So we'll remove, uh, we'll table this recommended motion 8A regarding the, the benches. And uh, there was some discussion about whether it should go to wellness committee if they're meeting soon or set up an ad hoc committee. And uh, we've had a little discussion about that just between the two of us. And we'll probably set up a quick committee. It'll have to move quickly because um, this is sort of a time sensitive issue. So thank you. All right. So that won't be on the agenda this evening. Uh, You're about to vote on that? Pardon? Well, we are about to. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda as revised. Pat Kirby. Second, Austin. Do we, don't think there's any other discussion. If you're ready then, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 6 0. Thank you. 6 0. Sorry. <coughs> action, I oh, action items. So we're moving straight to item uh, 8. B, you're on in a second, uh, Assistant Superintendent Owsley. Uh, I, I'd like to entertain a motion to adopt the proposed 2023-24 general fund budget amendment as submitted by Assistant Superintendent Owsley. Gerby. Gerby. Second? Second, Austin. All right, thank you. So, Miranda Owsley, the floor is yours, the podium is yours. Thank you. Um, up on the slide was the, the budget summary that was in your packet. Uh, this rolls all the way back, if you see, to the far left columns, the 2017-18, to kind of give those historical balances as we roll forward. The peach-colored columns are the original budget that we passed, if you remember back, that is in June. So it's uh, largely, there's a lot of unknown since the state budget does their budget from October to September, so there's a lot of unknowns how those things, we sometimes get them in legislative things, but not necessarily how they're going to roll out line by line um, for Celine. This is a February amendment, and then I continue to have the February 2024 estimates, but if you see in green, that's for the 24-25 year, and then from the 25-26 year in yellow. And those are basically those roll forward kind of budgets as everything remains the same. Um, we've been to you, you know, Steve has talked about many different things that he is um, intending to do with the district, but at this point in time, those are still projections that we're looking at working towards, so these are what we have in reality. So the estimates in the green and yellow column do not represent any attrition yet of any teachers or things that aren't going to be returning back from um, the replacements and retirements. Until I have a schedule to where I can s sustain that kind of thing, I use, I'm use i still using roll forward kind of numbers in that staffing model. 
So in general, a lot of the things um, that change throughout these budgets is on realities. We know a lot more about staffing. We know retirement rates. We know um, we're getting in that state aid. Um, so you'll see a lot of reductions. One of the greatest things I really want to point out, though, is part of our ORS, our retirement system, we get money through the district, and it comes in as a revenue, and then it leaves right as an expenditure. So it's a net zero to our bottom line. However, we have to spread it across all of our salaries. Last year, the state legislative put an extra pot of money, it was about $3.6 million that they handed to school, handed to Celine. We turned around and paid it back. Um, that is a big reduction, so it looks like it significantly dropped, but it would be in the, you would see that drop in the state sources and then also in the basic programs. In general, at the time in June, I didn't know if that would continue, so I just rolled over what we had last year. And then at this point in time, unless the legislative makes action in the middle of the year is not likely that that payment will be there so I took it out of the budget so it's a pretty big swing in that three million dollar range for um, those line items as well as you'll see late local sources um, increase you'll see a, an offset in the state um, sources in general the uh, pot and how we're funded in the local taxes and the state chips and the rest and that whole as we do that bar um, in the original budget timeline as our taxes go up it doesn't mean we actually get more revenue it means that state sources will come down because they don't have to chip in as much because they still dictate how much we get um, some other things to note that was one of the very big changes there's lots of little changes I mean we have 1500 different lines that I update along the way and then the biggest change was to that benefits category with the ORS um, pieces along there so in general as we those become reality for if we talk about different staffing models for fall and when we come back to the the board in um, June for for the original budget for 24 25 those would be at that time when we have those more reality of where those attrition could happen and then that model um, as we make it our goal always to make sure that our revenues and our expenditures are matching and they this off balance um, we obviously swung in the if you look down to the bottom we originally said our our revenues were going to be less than our expenditures at that 1.6 number and now we project that we are about 700,000 off from balance there still is a lot of one-time um, revenue kind of things that are coming in that we still want to make sure that as those fall off that we are continually looking to right size the district to make sure that we are not going, we land softly. Are there any questions for Miranda Owsley? We have one from Jennifer Stebbing. Yeah, Miranda, can you just talk a little bit about, and, and it's possible you just talked about this at the Finance Committee meeting, but the, the change in fund balance from um, the 2024-25 estimate to the 25-26, so going 20.2 to 7.4. Which one? Say it again, sorry. Uh, the fund balance, in the, the projection on fund, fund balance. In which two columns? Uh, green the last and, two, green the green and, and the yellow. yellow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I should have led with the colors. It's okay. <laughs> um, in general, the what do you mean on what that change was? Um, no, kind of just a little bit more storytelling about the reduction in fund balance down to seven point four. Just how how that got there because that that kind of stands out as if if I was a community member reading that, like, yep. what does that mean? If you can. In general, so the, the years, and there was a lot of um, one-time funding that came through. If you look through the 2020 through 2023, there's a lot of one-time funding things that came through, and there's a lot, a lot of things we put into place and also reduced back down. But fund balance itself is, is a, is a one-time, you know, it's revenues over expenditures in that year. And then in general, you know, you carry that forward. You basically have your fund balance. You add revenue to it and then you subtract what you spend out, and that's what's left. Um, in general, you know, you, you might say that that's a, you know, a lot of money that's sitting there, but when you equate it out to the number of weeks that the district could survive on that, that number, it ends up being a little bit more realistic of, of where you need to operate and just in the everyday going back and forth. But in general, we got to this, the historically, when we were at 5% fund balance, if we roll all the way back to 17, 18, 19, that was about two weeks of expenditures that the district had on hand as we moved forward. And so those kinds of 
um, conversations and how we do our job in the finance office become very difficult um, for cash flow purposes when you only have two weeks of cash on hand to, to meet your needs. So those kinds of things are really dire situations where you don't have a lot of timing as things change and from the state that does not give us a lot of timing to make adjustments and move forward or unexpected things that we see. If I could add too, just the um, it demonstrates the importance of sticking with that goal of reducing a million dollars from the general fund each year for the next three years because the quicker you get at that, it slows that down so that that twenty five twenty six isn't going to drop to seven point four percent. So that that's it's demonstrating the importance of doing the. Um, reductions that we're proposing and have been discussing with our staff for the last several months. So, anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll, pick, I'll piggyback on that and say that like that's the reason. Like, if you look at our um, February amended versus the prediction for twenty four twenty five green, the thing that, there's a couple things. Obviously, Miranda and I have exchanged emails about the ORS thing because that definitely jumped out at me about the three and a half million dollar swing between um, in basic program original versus, but then the ORS thing, and that, that's an all kind of an interesting thing. But when I look at our um, budget, I see almost a million dollars in one-time funds if you add together state versus federal. And so um, I do think because of our right sizing of the district and what have you, like our goal to do that and our goal through finance committee and through are still from my perspective as the finance chair of, you know the right way to go um, and I guess that's even makes me feel more confidently about that when I look at our numbers and look at then you know we end up being you know net you know like I, I agree with you I don't want to drop from 26 percent to 7.4 that's a drastic change and I, I I really don't think we'll realize that I think that's I think that's conservative budgeting which is what mm -hmm. we've always done and some of those kinds of things so yeah. anyway it's just important that we yeah we're budgeting conservatively but if we were to not make any moves yeah. that could be reality so we, we're just going to demonstrate confidence in the plan moving forward of that three-year plan to just reduce down so that more or less the fund balance stabilizes and, and won't see that kind of a dramatic drop. And I want to be clear, I have confidence in that plan. So. And that kind of rolls back to enrollment and how enrollment does fund a lot of our general fund. So in general, I already estimated approximately 87 kids dropping for this. So the original budget already had those state sources kind of reduced. We did see a reduction of you know, more like 100 students, um, but there's also some one-time-ish things that came to, we got some election, a little money for transportation for this, that, and the other, so it wasn't a huge difference, and there was an enrollment stabilization little pot of money, and those things are come into state aid and then also drop back off in years, so I continue in the other years forward, do not include very one time -y sort of things that the state does in um, our ongoing grants that are repetitive, I keep those in, and so it's more of a, they're a bonus when we have them, but we're not planning on having them in case that it doesn't keep going. And that's that's what the estimates in February, um, they're the 24, 25, and the 25, 26 also estimates I've kept in there. I think one is 110 um, student loss, and then another one, because it's a concept of a straight roll up if our continuing our low kindergarten class continues and the next kindergarten class is ex exactly the same. So it's those kinds of roll-up projections used in these numbers. Can I also ask a clarification? I, I know, Steve, you talked about the um, recommendations coming to the board table in May. Is that still the plan? And if so, do you know which meeting? You're referring to the strategic council recommendations. Yeah, we're, we're still gonna work towards a May, um, one of the May meetings, yet, those conversations are not really addressing the budget per se. They're more about programming changes. They potentially have impacts on the budget, but they would be down the road. So I think more of the specifics as it relates to the budget, those conversations are happening now. We're addressing that now. Um, Strategic Council is geared more on you know uh, different programs at the high school level, or we've talked about early childhood and early childhood center. Even if we were to move towards something like that, that wouldn't see we wouldn't see dividends till down the road of revenue enhancement. If that's what you're kind of wondering about. 
Thank you. Tim, I just want to kind of comment what Miranda said and just reiterate, you know, the all the little nuances of the financing, and I appreciate everything you do, Miranda, because it's it, it, it's a lot. It's a thick book of all your little things. But the idea of the the ORS, and some years they're giving the extra 147C, all the different 147s, really kind of gives a misconception of what the bottom line of this district really is and because it does come in and go right out so when somebody says oh it's a 68 one year and then it's 78 the next year well we did get a lot of one-time funds but they're they're pumping money into ors too so yep thank you i'd like to put this to a vote then now if no one has anything else to say all in favor please say aye aye opposed Hearing none. Um, Thank you. Can oh, I just oh. ask a um, point of order clarification? <coughs> who who was who recommended the motion and who seconded? Brad Gerby made the motion, supported by Tim. Um, I th I thought that that was revisions of the agenda. No, they they you did the second. You did them both. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion, please, uh, to accept the bargaining teams for the SEA 2024 collective bargaining negotiations as recommended and submitted by Carol DiGlio, Interim Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. And that team, I'll just say their names, consists of Carol DiGlio, Miranda Owsley, Kara Davis, Rex Clary, Emily Sickler, and Principal Teresa Steger. So moves, Tubman. Thank you. <coughs> Support gold. Support gold. I just have one quick thing to say. This is new to us. We haven't usually uh, listed the members of the team before, from my experience, and uh, it may be a best practice going forward. Apparently, other districts do this regularly. So is there any uh, discussion or any questions? And uh, Carol Diglio is right over there, ready to answer all of our questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, like you said, we typically don't have I guess that specific information um, with the team. Um, I know we've worked kind of with individual um, people. Um, so I guess this number of people, um, I guess, I, I, if, okay. <laughs> I guess is the question it, that, is this a usual there, number of people for a team? Yes, because there, there's many, uh, we have six people here, and so I was um, kind of surprised by that and just wanted more information. Thank you. How's that? It, it is um, pretty typical. One thing that I want to be mindful of is I don't have institutional knowledge. So uh, while I have practice and experience in doing the negotiations on many levels, um, I wanted to make sure that there was members on um, the S SAS district team that can help in discussions that um, require some institutional knowledge when you're doing negotiations. I also look at it as a great team building um, for both the SEA or whatever team we're negotiating with, with the district, so there is collaboration and there's a lot of opportunity for people to get to know each other on a deeper level and have discussions that are around the practices that we're all living into. Um, and it also helps to extend learning into um, the building levels, to have principals, a secondary and elementary principal on board that can help with bringing information back to their teams at the elementary and secondary level, and again, to provide some of that institutional knowledge. Great, I think, um, I think that's great um, to have multiple people mm -hmm. <laughs> out there um, mm -hmm. getting that feedback. Um, and I like process mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, completely this is transparency and I love it so oh thank great you. thank you appreciate it I appreciate you mentioning transparency that's exactly what I'd like to note that this uh, practice going forward will do will, will afford us an added level of transparency is there anything from the other side of the table I'll just add that this is typical with the number of people that are on the SEA negotiating team too that they don't just have a couple people. They yeah, have, they'll have at they least have four. They have a team mm -hmm. like this size. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Um, hi. Might be for you or Steve. So what's your role, Steve, then? Gonna be, are you 
typically a superintendent generally plays more of the moderator as you're getting closer okay. to negotiating a deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and usually is not part of this initial part. Now, I'll still be consulting, but in terms of the actual negotiations, it's generally not done with the superintendent. Okay. That's nice. And to anticipate a question, MASB recently, I was listening to Brad Manasik talking about this very thing and one of the podcasts from MASB, and they say that it's extraordinarily rare that any board members are on the team. Although it does happen, it's extremely rare and probably a best practice not to be on the negotiating team. So, Carol, thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's thank you. To a vote, please. Thanks, Susan. Oh, thank you. Is there anything else you want to add? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one scheduled report. They're in the hot seat now. Soon they're going to be at the hot podium. I'd like to introduce uh, our presenters, Ashley Mantha and Jeff Pike. Jeff has the clicker, so now we're official. I think we're live now. All right. The hot spot, as you just said. There we go. <laughs> well, I appreciate us uh, being here with you all again. Um, seems like every February, so it's good to see all the faces. Um, like I said, it's a report that we were scheduled for, so we're kind of doing an athletic update, um, a behind the scenes, so to speak, of athletics. Uh, our main focus is the 2022-23 school year. Last school year, because it's in its finality, it is completed, so we can report all the numbers accurately versus where we are right now, which is still finishing up this school year and winter season and spring hasn't even started yet. So. Um, with our department right now, thank you for doing the clicker, appreciate it. Um, this is our department, we return, this is, we have finished year two as of January, so it's been two complete full years, uh, few, January, not school years, um, and we're excited to go into our third year together as a group of three, so. Um, by the numbers, I'm gonna move this for a second, here we go, sorry. Um, this is a slide that we showed last year, but just to kind of reiterate um, our sports that are under our purview in the athletic department. There are 35 high school sports programs, boys and girls, um, as well as nine middle school programs that are in the athletic department. Um, there's a little bit of color coordination there for yourself, just to see, um, as Corey before for boys lacrosse came and did the public comment, mentioned that um, boys lacrosse and girls lacrosse is a self-funded varsity sport. So they're all varsity sports under our purview, but there's where it becomes, whether it's district subsidized or self-funded is where the, that difference is. So you can kind of see the yellow versus the gray, um, but there are, in the big picture, there are plenty of opportunities for our students um, in the fall, winter, and spring. Um, and as you can kind of see, I know there's a lot to kind of take in there, but we kind of break down, you know, JV, junior varsity, varsity, FR is freshman, um, and then obviously middle school, sixth, seventh, or eighth. We're mostly focused on seventh and eighth because that's MHSA grade level. Uh, but we do provide opportunities for some of our sixth graders in some of our bigger sports as well. Um, but that is just kind of like a nice little look of what is under the athletic department umbrella. Um, for the high school and the middle school, basically. Um, this is a new slide just because we've had some questions um, this past year of just kind of understanding classification of where is Celine and is that changing? Um, and sometimes you hear every state kind of classifies their schools differently. Sometimes you use the word division, sometimes it's class. Um, you hear these different letters like B, C, D, E, or you know, division one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kind of thing. So to kind of um, Give more clarification to that. Um, Celine is MHSA sanctioned school, and so we are a class A school and should be for the foreseeable future um, because as you can kind of see by that yellow diagram, um, anything over enrollment of 807 for the high school will be a class A school. So for the foreseeable future, we're class A. Where it gets more fun is by sport. So MHSA has multiple sports, and uh, basically whether a school can sponsor a sport puts in those numbers. So for instance, um, there are 756 high schools in Michigan. So in theory, you could have 756 soccer teams, you could have 100 swim teams, you could have 200 hockey teams, and I'm just using general numbers right now, but every sport is different, and that's why sometimes you see, um, as my example is showing on the slideshow, um, there sometimes is um, 
golf has four divisions. Uh, football has eight divisions. Swim and dive has three divisions. And so it's not just because of some random arbitrary numbering. It's does a school actually sponsor those sports to equal um, that equal divide of divisions? Um, for right now, we are division one across the board for MHSA sports. Um, but if you look at that third bullet point, I know I got a hockey player here too, kind of seen um, in my gymnastics. We got you. But as far as different divisions, um, hockey right now, we're about, you know, very close to um, our number next year is going to be 1643. We're 20 students away from being Division Two hockey. When you talk about little things like that of Division Two state championship versus Division One state championship, who are your opponents? Um, obviously, we're seeing enrollment down in Saline, but also throughout our SEC as well. So we, we don't know in that bar. It might be set the same, or do, are we all going down together, basically? Um, the enrollment that happened at Count Day in February around Valentine's Day, that's the number we use for next school year. Um, and we count our alternative high school, ECA, Y high in that number. So if you go in power school, it's not just straight up what's in our physical high school, but also alternative high school, um, who can play sports for us, basically. Um, and so that number for us next year is going to be 1643. Um, and that we'll find out in March, maybe April, of where we'll be for next year. And we project Division One for most of our sports, but in case something happens, we could be Division Two swim, we could be Division Two hockey, Division One soccer, and Division One tennis. It could be different based on the sport. And so, at least if you start to hear things like that, we're seeing a lot of those numbers change too. So, just wanted to give a little bit of heads up on that, and just kind of understanding when someone says Class A or Division One, that's what that's really talking about. So uh, these numbers pretty much speak for themselves. Um, the idea that we have a lot of students who are participating in both high school level sports and our middle school sports. Um, again, these are roster spots. So this is not 1,184 of the high school students participating. It's 1,184 roster spots. Um, and same thing for the middle school. So we have a lot of student athletes who are participating. So Caroline, a good example of multi-sport uh, athletes. Um, that's increasingly rare, but uh, that's included in, in all of these numbers. Uh, as far as the coaches, uh, 156 different adults filling the 185 coaching positions, and that includes volunteer coaching positions. Uh, and then something that's not on there that uh, we were looking at earlier today, uh, there are 40 different uh, staff members, SAS staff members, who are coaches, and some of them multiple season coaches. Uh, and that's something that's remarkable because we obviously would love to have our staff connecting with our students in different ways. So uh, definitely applaud uh, those staff members for, for putting in that extra time. So uh, this has a lot more information, uh, some of the different things that we do. So first and foremost, um, my most fun job is eligibility checks. Uh, so at the end of each trimester, uh, I make sure that our student athletes have passed the necessary requirements according to MHSAA. Having said that, we have higher standards uh, than MHSAA requires. So every two weeks, I will go through for both our high school students and our middle school students and make sure that they do not have uh, one E or more than one D. And if they were to fall into the uh, bad grade situation of either of those things, they do not participate. They do have a five-day leeway period to get their grades up if there's missing work to be turned in, et cetera. Uh, and parents and coaches and students are all consulted in that. Um, and so that's something that is something we take pride in, and it will come back on the other side in a, the next slide as far as grades and, and how well our students do. Uh, you might remember last year when we came, uh, we talked about big teams. Big teams is our registration system. Uh, some of you will agree the first time you log in your child in big teams, you think that you've like, you, you've suddenly gotten really old and don't know how to do uh, any electronic work at all. Um, and then the good news is once you're in, you're in. So uh, that's helpful. Um, but it, it is thorough. It collects a lot of information. It allows our coaches and our office to see everything and to keep track. We no longer have papers that we have to worry about finding someone's athletic physical. God forbid there's an emergency. Everything is electronic. The coaches and trainers have that on hand. So uh, that's a big thing. Uh, something we did last year, uh, working with community ed uh, and with uh, Lori Dawson and our clubs and extracurricular advisor, uh, we all have our handbook uh, together now. 
Uh, so our policies are the same across the board, and the goal in that is to make it consistent for students and for family members. Uh, and so the uh, link on there is our most recent update from 2023 in which we did that. Uh, other things that we've done, we try to offer uh, a lot of leadership opportunities for our students. And so some of our athletes joined us uh, a couple of different SEC conferences that we have. Each of the 14 SEC schools will bring 10 students to uh, different things. So a leadership conference we do in the fall. Uh, and then Ashley and uh, the AD from Pioneer and a couple of our teachers and administrators from uh, Dexter were leaders in creating a uh, women's uh, leadership conference to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX last year. And so that was something that our conference had never done. We then invited uh, 10 female student athletes from each of the 14 schools as well to offer leadership training and guest speakers. Uh, and that's something that they continued with this past year, so we'll talk about that next year. Uh, as far as DEI, we are both committed to continuing that work. And uh, last school year we had Dr. Washington uh, going team by team to have a session on being a good ally. Uh, and that's something we wholeheartedly believe in and look forward to continuing now. Uh, even though Dr. Washington has uh, moved on, we are looking to continue that with our, our teams uh, for each season uh, going forward. Uh, and then the last thing is somewhat delicate is our uh, student section expectations. And uh, what we are trying to do is to have the students have fun and also not cross the line. And so as educators, we are trying to teach them uh, gestures uh, that would not be appropriate, but others that would be, or sayings that would perhaps not be appropriate. Or, um, and we want the kids to have fun. We don't want to have uh, a reputation among our opponents or officials uh, of being obnoxious. We want to be loud, and we want to have everyone enjoy themselves. Uh, and that's really a conference-wide thing. Uh, the conference tries to get us to avoid saying names and numbers and cheering for your team, not against the other team. Uh, this is more of a societal thing. This is obviously not just Celine or the SEC, but um, big goals that, that we have, to say the least. Uh, I mentioned the academics and uh, grade checks. Uh, this is why we do the grade checks, and the reflection here is kind of amazing, uh, that we have student athletes who are taking additional hours of their weeks uh, consistently, and in each of the three trimesters, you can see for the high school students, this is uh, from varsity athletes, uh, their GPAs are higher than the average student. And perhaps this isn't a surprise that you know if a student athlete is involved in something, they are committed. So you're committed to your team and you're also committed to your studies. Uh, but this is to commend all of the student athletes for these high achievements. That's kind of amazing to, uh, to look at what they've been able to do in the classroom because really that's what we're about. We're about educational athletics. Uh, when Ashley and I were hired, we talked about student athlete, the student coming first, and, and this is really what the emphasis uh, should be placed on. So congrats to the students for that. To follow up the academic excellence, there is we have, the, we just wanna make note of the athletic achievements as well from 2022, 2023. Um, and this is, I know it's a lot of color coming at you right now, um, but it, I know, <laughs> if you want to zone in on the yellow or the gold, you can kind of find Celine real easy, right? Everything else, you're just like, ah, it's other schools. But um, what the, basically what you're looking at is there's 14 schools in the SEC, there's eight schools in the red division, which Celine is in, and there are six schools in the white division. Um, makes up our nice conference. Um, each season, we kind of keep track um, historically of which school takes what sport title, so to speak. Um, and so on that left column, you see fall sports. In the middle, you see winter sports and spring sports on the far right. Um, and we were very blessed to have nine of the possible 26 SEC championships last year. Um, quick math, that's one in three, basically, that the Selene team won for the conference, which is an amazing feat in itself. Um, like I said, you can, you'll see some schools in there that have maybe one championship, and we were fortunate to have um, nine last year. So um, if you can kind of see the yellow, you see boys cross country, boys soccer, girls volleyball, girls basketball, boys ice hockey, uh, baseball, girls soccer, softball, and boys track and fields. Um, so it's very something very proud to be for the, like I said, the conference that we're part of. So. 
And besides the uh, conference championships, uh, the next three slides will just do a brief breakdown from each of the three seasons of not just SEC championships, but district and regional championships. Uh, so as you can see for boys cross country finishing seventh in the state, uh, fall of 2022, girls cross country fourth in the state, girls field hockey in the semifinals, and I look forward to when they beat Pioneer. Uh, boys soccer uh, going to the regional finals, girls swim and dive third in the state, including a state champion diver. Uh, girls volleyball, as uh, Dr. Lotch presented earlier, uh, making it to the state semifinals, uh, and then boys water polo in the quarterfinals of the regionals. Uh, from winter, uh, you have uh, girls basketball, uh, also won districts besides winning the conference. Uh, gymnastics last year qualified three for the states. Uh, boys hockey pictured there, the SEC champions, uh, that was their back-to-back -back year. Uh, boys Swim and Dive finished sixth in state in 2023, and wrestling won the district championship as well as qualifying three wrestlers for the state finals. And then lastly, from spring of 2023, uh, baseball league and district champions, golf, 16th in states, rowing, two students qualifying for nationals, girls soccer making it to state semifinals, softball also uh, district champions as well as conference champions, Boys track and field, 10th in the state. Girls track and field, 30th in the state. And water polo finishing 6th in the state. And uh, one picture to highlight on that screen there, the boys and girls softball teams. We hosted the districts for both of those uh, teams, and they both won championships within half an hour of one another. So they were able to come together for a truly championship uh, picture. So that was pretty cool. Uh, overall, we also have three different uh, signing days that you sometimes uh, hear about or maybe see on our social media that we have students who are playing at the next level. And so we celebrate that three times a year as they officially commit to their uh, next level of education and athletic uh, achievement. All right. So into our coach training requirements, I get a lot of questions of I mean, you know, we, we just talked about 185 coaching positions, right? That's a, that's a community to run all of our programs. Um, and we do want to make sure we're going to talk about safety and just the training that goes into it to just to know what, behind the scenes. Um, we all talk about just, oh, coaches just show up and just do it. But um, it is a part-time job on paper. We all know it's full-time responsibility and full-time care, right, that we all appreciate our coaches doing. Um, they are the first responder a lot of times. They are... Uh, mandatory reporters, they are mentors, they're the first line for mental health sometimes. It's all these things that we, you know, we put on a part-time job, so to speak, um, and we want to give them credit for that and their excellence in that. Um, and just kind of an understanding of where they're coming from and what's required to be a coach at Selene Area Schools. Um, every single coach is fingerprinted. They're not allowed to be around our students, paid or not, volunteer, um, before they're fingerprinted and cleared. Um, they do, every single head coach, varsity, JV, freshman, middle school, has to be CPR trained. And that, um, we work with Nurse Karen um, and Strategic Collaboration. We do three times a year. So there's opportunities always to be recertified um, for those what-if situations, unfortunately, should they arise. Um, to go along with that, our team emergency action plans. Uh, Mickey Tillette and Natalie are athletic trainers, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, they go around with our teams and actually show where's your nearest, nearest AED, what happens if coach goes down, what happens if student goes down, all these kind of situations, where's, how do you do 911, who does all those kind of risk assessments. Kind of. So our athletic trainers are very awesome for that, and they go around with our teams. Um, our coaches are also, um, each, I should say, each high school has to go through uh, a rules test, which is nice for their sport specific, but within that there's a mental health aspect as well as concussion, heat index, all those other safety things, very similar to what teachers do for GNC training and all those um, bloodborne pathogens, all those kind of th other safety issues that he was watching. Um, then uh, to add on to that, we have our coach meeting. We had a retreat this past August 1st where all of our coaches were invited, high school and middle school. We did an onboarding, we did safety, um, Rex actually came and talked about the bond a little bit. Uh, we had some socializing, but a lot of that was um, basically onboarding. And there's a slideshow there, which I know you all can click on, but others, our coaches have access to that as well. Um, we do have some parent and student surveys we started last year, so we can kind of get an inside of what's going on day to day with our teams, because 
Mr. Pike and I are unfortunately not there 24-7 with every single team, um, as we do have, I know it's crazy, right? We can't be everywhere. I have 35 teams, I know. So the inside uh, scoop, so to speak, we can kind of hear back from students and families. Um, varsity coaches are required to have cap one or two, which is MHSA's um, coach advancement program. Basically, it's training coaches to be coaches. Um, there's different. There's eight different levels, and they each are six hours, and you can get t t uh, professional development hours for going to those as well. Um, but it's just nice of, you know, someone might know their sports, but maybe they don't know how to coach per se. So it's that person coming out um, to learn how to coach, and that's the simplified version of it. Um, every time I hire a new coach, I do have mentoring with them. I onboard them for a few hours. I think there's a document there of a recent hire, um, but we do go through to make sure that they not only know Celine's institutional knowledge, but they get them ready and things that I wish I had known when I was a new varsity coach, per se, kind of thing. So it's kind of one of those, you've been in the trenches, let me try to help you with what I wish I had known or I do know, so to speak. Um, we provide them with a mentor coach as well that might be more experienced for something I may not be able to answer for them, per se. Um, and the Be Nice mental health program is available for all of our teams. That is run through MHSAA. It's part of their coach meeting as well. Um, and then we're also in the process of, um, we worked on our student handbook this past summer. So another fun project for us this summer will be working on our coaches handbook, which will be in complimentary of our, um, our summer retreat and our um, meetings already. Like I'm making a handbook, so to speak, of that. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I kind of mentioned some of these already, but um, you know, when you have certain situations like Bronny James, um, basketball player, and Damar Hamlin last year, all these situations you might see on TV or in the news, where athletes go down, unfortunately, those bizarre situations. Even though you're planned, you have everything situated, but those what if situations. And we try to do our best to prepare our coaches, our students, our athletic trainers. Um, just for those, un, you know, unfortunate situations. Um, like I mentioned before, our coach training, every coach uh, goes through concussion videos, CPR training, um, EAPs is emergency action plans with our athletic trainers. Um, we have AEDs all around our athletic facilities. I believe we're at 10 right now just with easy access. Our athletic trainers also always have a portable AED on them. So whether they're outside, in the pool, the gym, um, they always have one near them. So we're very fortunate that we have usable ones. Um, we start, I have a group message with all my head coaches for those quick instances where email just doesn't do it, right? And there's no inform a cast outside, which I love that system, but you know, it's one of those things where if I've got rowing on the water, if golf course, bowling alley, hockey rink, we're everywhere, right? That kind of thing. So I do have a group message going with our coaches, um, for those snow day cancellations, heat index, when the wet globe thermometer says, hey, 105, we're done with all activities, right? Um, if there's a lockdown, Fortunately, we had the Walmart situation a year ago, that, that kind of thing, where it's like, hey, if you're outside, time to come on in, kind of thing. Our own version of our athletic um, safety protocols. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we are very fortunate to have two full-time athletic trainers. Um, so we always have someone, whether it be inside, outside, especially when we start having, uh, let's say, volleyballs inside, soccer's outside, water polos in the pool, right? We're with multiple locations. Everyone has their contact information, and they're easily accessible. And, of course, 911 for those emergency ones. But um, we are very fortunate to have two students, usually, from Adrian College work with our athletic trainers, extra hands to help with those, I don't want to say mundane tasks, but taping, Band-Aids, you know, those where they're not fully trained yet, but they're, they're able to assist where our trainers can look after the more serious things as needed. Um, of security, we do hire out Pittsfield Township police and security for those bigger events, whether it be football, basketball, soccer, hosting districts, regionals, where there's just the presence alone de-escalates a lot of those situations in case there's fighting, in case there's rivalry. Um, it's just those what-if situations. Someone's already on site and can call it backup if needed. Um, and so we do hire out for those bigger games. We also provide game workers for more of that spectator, those low escalations, that if hopefully they never need to, but for that. And, of course, our official safety. It's... Uh, they like to go after our officials sometimes with the spectators, right? Go figure. I know. we got to protect them, too, because we want them to come back. We want to have games go on, right? Um, and then, obviously, we are, our ministry of support, whether it be central office, our principals, our deans, um, when they're there, too, the students, our, our parents, everything is just, it just runs together as one big, it works so well, nice together. Yes, it's very nice. Um, of course, all this costs money, right? Um, we kind of showed this last year, and numbers have changed just slightly, but you know, not too much. The same categories um, are very much saying the same big categories. Um, it's always interesting when I talk to people outside of here, or just you know, small talk. They're like, "Oh, why don't you pay for this? What's going on? Where does the money go?" 
Um, Celine has everything. Your facilities are beautiful. You must have millions and unlimited wallet. Um, as you all know, we are a public school, right? There is <laughs> a finite amount. Um, we are very fortunate to have what we have. Um, but just for those people to kind of, like I said, pull the curtains back of knowing where our money goes, um, Miranda was so kind to give me a nice little easy version of looking up these numbers. So um, though we almost have a $1.5 million, that sounds amazing. When you really break it down into, as we talked about, 1,100 roster spots, 35 um, sports at the high school, nine at the middle school, 185 coaches that you have to pay. Certain things, the money just evaporates real quick. Um, and that one big category, the biggest one, is our salaries and benefits, which is $1.1 million out of that $1.46. So with that, we basically have about $350,000 left to take care of the other necessities to make sure the games go on. And this money is for our district subsidized. Um, no team is fully 100%. No, there's, everyone has these you know, myths of like, oh, they, this team gets this, this team gets this. In, in full transparency, there is no team that gets everything from, from taxpayer dollars. And that's where student activity accounts and fundraisers and additional donations and so forth comes into play to cover those other items that teams will need. So a couple things on there that of note, um, as I mentioned, $1.1 million for salaries and benefits. Our athletic trainers that we so appreciate and for our safety, um, we have two of them. So we're paying their salaries through Trinity Elite, uh, 100000 Our officials to make sure the games are gone and the game workers, so scoreboard operators, um, book, all those kind of things to just make sure the game goes on. Uh, we spend about 80000 Transportation, when available, we appreciate when we do have bus drivers. And by the way, we need more bus drivers in case you're hearing this. Um, so um, when we do are able to, we're spending about $65,000 uh, on that. Um, security and police, as I mentioned, about $15,000. Uh, to enter tournaments, invites, about $30,000. And then we are, we're left with about $70,000 each, each school year to spend on miscellaneous things that come up. Last year, we had a couple scoreboards go down, right? We, rent, uh, we have to rent porta johns for those big events like track and baseball and softball. So all these little things that start to add up that are ancillary but still very much necessary is where that extra miscellaneous kind of comes into. And then all of a sudden, we're just we're tapped out kind of thing. It goes really quickly, as I mentioned. Um, but it is, uh, yes, I was going to say, you got nice. Perfect. I'm going to let, oh, it's still me. Never mind. Carry on. More budget stuff. <laughs> Um, a lot of those common budget questions, too, we just mentioned it's about $1.5 million, but a lot of people say, well, you just had a $180 million you know, bond. Why don't you just use money for that? Um, and as I know you all know this, but that money, yep, that money is set for what it, you voted on, right? And so we cannot pull money. So if I need a new bench for a current weight room, nope, that money is going to the new weight room, right? And so a lot of people are like, oh, you have all the money. But no, that is set aside for what is um, determined for. So... Um, Pay-to-play participation fees, um, we do collect these. Uh, high school is $325, middle school is $275, and that is for the entire school year. So whether you play one sport, two sport, three sport, it is a one-time per school year. Um, we do have waivers. We do have scholarships available, need-based, um, and that's something you come talk to our athletic office about, and we can take care of that as well. Um, but that is, brings in about $270,000. So a lot of people say, oh, it should cover everything. And as I just mentioned, we spend about $1.5 million, so $270,000 is, is helping, but it is not covering all of our costs. We're not a cost-neutral department. Um, some other revenues we take in is our gate revenue, um, about $75,000 to $110,000. And that does range because based on how many home games we have versus away games. Each year could be different. Each season's a little bit different. But it is a nice little range of understanding of what we expect to take in as far as revenue. Um, it does offset some of our department costs, but once again, um, it's kind of a drop in the bucket of our 1.5. It doesn't fully cover that. Um, so with that being said, all of that 1.46, as mentioned, um, with approximately 350000 in revenue, our actual cost of the uh, general budget is around $1.1 million. So just kind of having those numbers out there as well. Mr. Pike. So as far as communication, obviously very important to get the word out and to help our student athletes and our parents uh, and guardians. Uh, the, the website is something I'm very proud of. Um, that was part of big teams. Not only is there the registration side of things, but there's the schedule. And everything is updated immediately on that. Uh, it gives directions to events. Uh, and then when the events are over, I try to get every single score from every single sport. 
uh, seventh grade all the way up, um, regardless. So uh, that's something that's uh, an, an important thing. And uh, along with that, as, as far as spreading information, uh, social media. Uh, last year that I uh, we were here, I joked about uh, not knowing about social media, and yet I'm in charge of it. Um, and thanks to my 17-year-olds at home, I now can do uh, Instagram a little bit better than last year. So uh, there's that. But um, truthfully, this is something that it helps spread the word from our successes. It helps add to information. And so that's incredibly important. Uh, something else that Ashley does every week is uh, send out a district-wide uh, schedule for what's going on and then highlights of different things, uh, especially such as right now we're in playoff season. And so each week giving an idea of what is upcoming for teams or how teams uh, performed. Uh, we also include that type of information in our school newsletters. So that works for the middle school and high school students as well. Uh, sometimes we'll have information that we need to send out through Student Central, which is, is the big teams. And so therefore, if we hire a new coach, everyone who participated in that sport previously uh, gets a, a message to know what's going on for, for that. Uh, and then hopefully for February in perpetuity, we will be here to, uh, to update for the board. So uh, the goal overall with communication, obviously, um, is to always improve and to always give access to information. And so if members of the public ever have any question, uh, obviously we can uh, try to help them in any way possible. Uh, so lastly, just uh, thank you. Um, we, uh, the three of us in our office, could not do this without the support of countless people. Uh, the student athletes, like the two that are represented here today, um, we wouldn't be here to watch them and to praise them. Uh, so that would, that would be uh, huge. And then, as I said earlier, the coaches, the amount of time that the coaches put into it, the pride, and it's not just about winning, it's about teaching. And so that's something we uh, are very, very proud of. Uh, parents and volunteers, whether it's a funded sport or a partially funded sport, uh, it takes a lot of people involved, and uh, we're very, very thankful for that. Uh, for buildings and grounds, and then also skip down to transportation to thank uh, Rex and everyone in his department. Um, the fields are always in pristine shape. The number of times we get compliments from other schools about that is is countless uh, and as far as transportation while we do need more bus drivers this year we have had a lot more of our teams able to use our transportation so we're very very thankful for uh, buildings and grounds and transportation for that uh, and the custodial staff uh, who are always there to set up and always there to clean up uh, we obviously uh, depend on them greatly uh, ashley's talked about the trainers and security uh, our administrators and teachers, uh, the number of times that we'll have other coaches say, wait a minute, your principal, your superintendent is coming to your sporting events? And we say, yes, and we're, we, we know we're lucky in that regard, but perhaps also that should be a, a, something that we uh, thank everyone for. So thanks, Dr. Lotch, appreciate all of that. Um, and then the Community and Board of Ed, all of your support for all of these things that we do. It's not just about the dollars. Uh, it's about the kids, and so thank you very much for, for what you do to support us in our endeavors. Thank you for a great presentation. Now, I know you, um, <clears throat> you uh, brought hydration this evening. With any, I'm recovering from a little sickness last week, so oh. it's not you know prepped for this, but that's, well, we are I, ready. <laughs> I, we, we may have a few questions for you, but I, I, if there are any extended disco questions uh, that need to be taken offline, I know you'll be able to respond very quickly. More Thank than happy you. to. So anyone around the table have any urgent pressing questions? Start with uh, Mr. Austin. Mine's not really a question, but been attending uh, probably more of the sporting events this year and uh, see you two at a lot of them. And so your, your, your day doesn't just go from 8 or 7 to 5. It's long nights on many nights. So thanks. Thank you. All right, I have a few things. Um, first of all, um, before I get too far into this, um, I was talking to, to Jenny Miller, and she wanted to reiterate to you, because she couldn't be here tonight, how fortunate and how lucky she feels to have been able to have her three children go through high-level programs. Um, you've mentioned like having senior signing events. Those are really special things for families, and I thank you for doing those things. I know it doesn't just happen. So anyway, um, I also want to reiterate my incredibly strong support and thankfulness for and gratefulness for the for the amount of programs we run and the quality of the programs we run. But it's you guys, it's coaches, it's like you mentioned that whole list of of individuals with buildings and grounds, and I even think about people like helping with. 
f concessions and making yeah. sure we have pizza and like just simple things, but we do things at such a high level. Um, one thing I would say is that, and every time I pay my kids soccer, I always think about this, what incredible value we get for $325. I mean, our coaches are not just good, they're great, right? They could get jobs in other places and they could do high level coaching things and we get them for $325 a seat or even a year and you get multiple. So anyway, I wanna make sure that I, I say like, thank you for all the opportunities that our kids have and all of it. I appreciate the emails that you send us with events and keeping us updated. I appreciate the focus, you know, a year ago when you came to us, we were having some culture challenges and I want you to know how much I appreciate it as a board member, and I almost am like nervous to say this out loud, but like it appears <laughs> some of that has calmed down. Um, and so I know that doesn't just happen, that's training, that's individualization with athletes and teams, and so I want you to hear from me how much I appreciate the two of you and your leadership, and that, I'm sure that goes in a top-down way, so thank you for that. Um, I wanna, I've loved the idea of athletic trainers going over safety with their teams, right? I'm a, I'm a Manchester you know, teacher and I've been a former coach and I've never done it. Like as a, that, what a smart thing to do with your individual, you know, we, we, we do fire drills. We do all these things to practice for that and you're right with like LeBron James's son and Hamlin and like those things happen. And so anyway, I, I just want you to know that I, I really um, thought about that. Uh, I really love our prioritization about academics and success. And you know, and one of the things, I guess I'm not surprised to see that um, our student athletes do such a good job because they have to have such strong team, time management skills, right? And so that's one thing that if I was like pushing, I'd say, this is a reason why to join a team and to try a sport. Earlier talking about lacrosse, you know, try it because I think one, your kid is gonna be surrounded by positive energy and positive things to do every day after school, but also have to learn those basic time management skills. You learn how to do that and do it well. So anyway, so that's that. All right, so here are my questions. Um, and you don't have to answer them now. Uh, um, based public comment got me thinking about this. How often do we revisit um, self-funded versus district programs? How often do we look at that? I feel like I do it daily, but yeah. <laughs> to be fair. No, I, I, it's, we've talked about this with uh, finance with um, there's a lot of things that go into the why, and I would love to support, honestly. Anyway. And that honestly becomes, hey, board, I need more money yeah. kind of thing. Um, as you kind of saw within our 35 teams, or it's, hey, we need to remove some teams, which I don't want to do. I'm not trying to scare anyone listening right now kind of thing, but it's one of those things when there's a diminishing interest and teams start to shrink, you're like, well, is it worthwhile to continue paying for this sport versus maybe something that's growing? Um, and so it is a yearly thing for sure that we actually talk about. Um, but I, I made a joke, but honestly, there's teams weekly that hit me up and were like, hey, what about us? What about us? Yeah. And they're like, I, it's growing. Your sport is growing. But we need this. We need this. Or we need this. Right. Um, do we have systems, though, in place where, like, we do a review every three years or we do a review? That's what I'm wondering. It's very funny. We had an extracurricular meeting today, and I actually brought that subject up. Yeah. I keep, he's laughing because it's one of those it's, – it's such on a – there is no policy per se. Um, there's nice little, there's direction, there's guidance, there's what do you think is best. Um, but that's what I was meeting with Lori Dawson, um, Ashley Howes of Community Education. It's like, why is this sport under you? Why is this sport under club? Why is it me? How do we get it from you know, a community sport to a varsity sport versus a self-funded sport? versus a district subsidized. But it's like, what are those levels? Um, and we do have a very rough draft of what that looks like, but um, we actually, I'm in charge of that committee now to make sure we have a better process in place for, I mean, I'll use boys volleyball as an example. It's right. growing, it's in community ed right now. MHSA might be voting on it soon to make it an MHSA sanctioned sport. Right. And that's exciting, it's growing, right? It went from like 10 teams to now 58 teams in the state. That's exciting, but one, but then it becomes, okay, where's the facility it's gonna use? It's a boys sport, Title IX complications. Yeah. I gotta bring in a girls sport now. All these things, it's not just like, ooh, I like your sport kind of thing. So it is definitely a daily uh, conversation in our athletic office of um, sports that we, we would love everyone to be part of athletic. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and I appreciate yeah. you doing that. And I want to make sure that I also state, um, at, in my public comment, I had stated my strong preference for us revisiting things like letter processes mm -hmm. and recognizing more students. And those conversations, I've been told, are yeah. happening. And so I want you to hear from me. Thank you. 
All right, I, I'm, I am thankful for you continuing to look for ways that we can recognize as many students as possible. Um, I was, I've been hearing a little scuttlebutt about more divisions in sports. So like, for example, not having four state champions in basketball, mm -hmm. having six like we do, or eight like we do mm -hmm. in, in basketball. Is that actually a, potentially a real thing or is just like what to be determined? That to be determined. The Rep Council of MHSA votes on certain things and they usually announce things in May. Um, that is based on each sport. So it wouldn't be just across the board for sports. It'd be individualized. Um, and that's based on what is their bracket look like for districts, regionals, and states. Um, football has 64 in each of them because they like to do a – you're doing a one-on-one -on -one competition. It goes from 32 to 16 to 8 to 4 to 2. You can't just have 100 random teams in one division, right, uh, versus basketball has about 250 schools in each division. So when you say you're a Division One champion of – one sport, you might have, oh, sorry, there's a little reverb back there. Um, so every sport does have different um, nuances, and that'd be voted on by sport at the MHSA, and then it comes down to us, and we accommodate to that. Okay. Yeah. I, I will tell you that I would be a strong yep. proponent of more divisions and letting more kids yep. feel what it's like to be a champion. Yep. Right, and feel good about those things. Yep. Um, anyway, so I, I have a couple other things that I think I'm going to send you via email. Thank you very much, though. Like, I appreciate it. You're here late. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. It's lunchtime soon. It looks like we're <clears throat> sliding the other table, but I do want to give the students' representatives a chance to pipe up if they have something. Um, I just want to say thank you because this year the gymnastics team did go through the process of hiring a new coach. Miss Mantha was great about that, so thank you. We love our coach. Super excited to look for an assistant coach and continue to grow the program, so thank you for that. Yeah, same with hockey. We appreciate everything you do for all the students with the student section and teams and stuff like that. And hopefully soon, every single sport can be a school-funded school. -funded school. Uh, We'd love to take you on hockey. I love hockey. I don't hockey, know if we can pay for hockey. Yeah, your, your ice time alone, we got to talk. <laughs> yeah. Does the athletic department cover the cost of hair bleep? <laughs> no. I hear they cover that themselves, but you're styling, you're styling. Working down the table, we have uh, Jennifer and... Go Hornets. Thank you for the great presentation. And Michael, thank you for specifically calling out Mateo and Caroline since they are excellent representatives of um, academics and uh, athleticism at, at the high school. Um, I had one question and a couple of comments. So at the last board meeting and in, in my, my personal comments, I said something about how I have had the opportunity to visit a lot of high schools in winter sports season this year. And um, I am just very impressed by the ambassadors that our student athletes really are for both academics and for how they carry themselves as representatives of our district when they're out of the building. Um, and then conversely, when we're hosting things and um, the comments that, that I get when I'm wearing my Hornet gear and they don't know I'm on the Board of Education and, and other family members saying, uh, saying, wow, like our grandkids get to have this or, or people from other districts saying what beautiful facilities you have and how excellent they're, they're maintained and how um, staff are present to, to support those, those students. Um, it really matters and it shines through. And so I hope that you do hear, that we also hear that all of the time. So thank you. Thank you. Um, also, thank you for all of the, the facets with regards to, I don't want to steal Lawrence Thunder since she's the physician and not me, but, but there's a, a lot of diligence, whether it's in the big teams with the, um, the forms, uh, or it's, it's the trainers, it's Dr. Dean, um, thank you, I'm so glad they were all there in Belleville with us during the last football season, they were like another coach on the field. Um, it's so important and emergencies do happen. And we read about those all the time, so it's really nice when we talk about safety and security. We we focus on our buildings and our grounds quite a bit, but we have a lot of um, both staff and students who are out at you know um, you know whether it's rowing or whether it's swimming or whether they're at a golf course somewhere else, like you said. So it's it's really important. Um, I wanted to ask about data from the surveys that you mentioned. And first of all, thank you for asking parents and guardians and for asking students. I thought, think that's very important. But my question was, um, can you tell us a little bit about what happened with that? And, and kind of um, if you think you'll repeat that process for winter and spring sports and moving forward in the future. 
Yes. So I usually wait till the season ends before I send them out. Um, I know as a cheer mom, you'll be getting yours shortly kind of thing. And Jenny, as a swim parent, will be getting dive, will be getting hers as well. Um, we did that last year, and it was a very, I think since this was the first year, a lot of parents and kids were apprehensive. They're like, who's going to see this? Where is it going? And I try to put that proactive message of it comes to me and only me. Um, and so that's, it's doing this the second time around. We started in the fall again. Um, I've seen a lot more come through this year than I did last fall because I don't tell names kind of thing. Not that's because it's supposed to be you know, a little sneaky or anything. It's just more sometimes like, hey, coach, this is something you're doing great. I want to highlight this. And they're like, oh, I didn't know they liked that. Like, oh, your overnight camp trip, that's great team bonding. They love that. They love the T-shirts. They love the team dinners. You know, all those kind of things that coaches need to hear positive affirmation as well. So I would say 95% has been positive kind of thing. And every now and then, I say that 5%, I'm just making up percentages, by the way, but it's very small um, where it's something like room for improvement. Hey, did you know when you do your cut process, you're actually making a kid feel bad when you do it this way? What if you changed it to this kind of thing? So we kind of have those conversations at the end of the season where I talk with themes with my coach. I don't say, hey, Jeff Pike said this of you. I say, you know, a parent recommended that they didn't really like your cut process. Like, walk me through what you do kind of thing. So we talk about themes and patterns and um, and just kind of highlight the things, like I mentioned, like that needs to be giving kudos and some things that may be for improvement. But I've definitely seen more come in for students and um, parents and I need to find a way to get more even more kind of thing because um, like a team of 20 I might get seven or eight back kind of thing so it's not a full encompassing view but it's enough where I can get an idea of someone that's really happy or someone that has some concerns so to speak. I, so I filled out three of them for fall <laughs> um, so I got to experience this firsthand I was like oh I was, I was very impressed okay. and and I think being on the board now in my sixth year and seeing the emails that we've received over the years, sometimes we hear a lot about certain topics, but we always wonder about what's the other 90% thinking or what's the mm -hmm. other 80%. Again, I don't know the exact percentages. And I think that those evaluations and especially asking for student voice give every single participant and family the opportunity to speak up and feel um, like it's uh, it's safe and, and that they can, they can report that yeah. in. So thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple questions were answered, well, asked and then answered, because um, I was uh, curious about uh, the self-funded versus uh, district subsidized. Mm -hmm. um, is anything covered with the self-funded or like the coaches or? I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Uh, the short answer is no. Um, so for ice hockey, for example, like um, they pay for everything, everything. And so you're talking um, uh, ice time and uniforms and travel and things like that. Um, for the uh, district-funded sports, there are still going to be sometimes team fees that are additional or expectations of working concession stands or things like that. So uh, trying to find a balance between those things. Um, but again, the, the money is, is limited, unfortunately. And whether we'd love to take on boys lacrosse as uh, as Corey talked about in the um, public time um, we'd love to do that for multiple sports but unfortunately not not able to do that all the time um, have you considered or I guess something to consider um, maybe well sometimes if you don't use the 70,000 <laughs> um, or like having sort of a grant fund or some funding that you could give some like each of the teams or that they can apply for for specific things um just just putting an idea out there that's yeah um Miranda not to put you on like we've talked a lot about different possibilities um because in my head I would love to give even the self-funded something like, hey maybe I'll pay your coaches or maybe I'll pay your buses so at least you get to the event safe kind of things so we've tried to work those ways um but that 70k as you just mentioned it's it's kind of like the the oh crap kind of money where like something broke, something needs to be maintained. Yeah. Uh, you know, with baseball and uh, softball scoreboards go down. Those are about four or 5,000 each kind of thing. So those things of maintaining, mm -hmm. it's the, the rainy day fund is a better word for it, I guess, so to speak of, um, but that's what we're, we're trying to find creative ways to, to help all of our teams. So we're, Miranda and I are brainstorming and we're, we look for, if you guys have ideas, we'll take it. All right. <laughs> I have an idea, actually. Okay. I was going to say something Let's about the it. Foundation for Selene Area Schools in a little while. Yep. I, I know they do a lot of grants, and I know our, our friend Joe Elton. Yep. Um, 
has received a lot of grants yep. over the years, whether you know in the beginning at Pleasant Ridge o- yep. all the way to the high school. I, I wonder if there's some kind of partnership there with the funding because sometimes they allocate X number of dollars, like I think it's 90 thousand some, yep. something this year, and not all of those go used. Right. Um, and not I there I know that they're not looking to subsidize something on an ongoing basis. They they you know think about experimentation and new philosophies and teaching and things like that, but. I don't know. So I would talk with them. We definitely forward that on to our coaches, as well as the Crabtree one that just came out this past week as well. So um, as you said, for those once in a while, new equipment, uniforms, something that doesn't happen every year, but those big things that are hard to purchase, for sure. Um, I have multiple questions. Did you have something related? I'm going to spend an hour and a half on, on this. <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned the CPR. I think this came up last time that it's only like head coaches are required. Um, and you mentioned athletic trainers, um, which is great, like a, a support. Um, so I'm wondering, um, are athletic trainers at all sports? Um, and if uh, a head coach isn't there, um, what, I guess, resources are there to use in case of an emergency? Great question. So there is no athletic event unless a coach is there. Kids can't just show up and, like, in the gym, we actually shoot them out because there's no adult there for the what-if moments. So uh, someone that's been eye-chatted, background checked, CPR has to be there to open up the gym, open up the field, open up the pool, open up whatever it may be. Um, and so... Um, As you mentioned, not every coach, but every head coach, and that honestly is the majority of our coaches because we don't have, um, I mean, I'll use, uh, let's say baseball. You've got your head varsity coach certified. Your head JV coach is certified. Your head freshman coach. So your three teams, everyone is certified. And most of the assistant coaches on baseball are CPR because they're either PE teachers or someone else too. So um, we do offer it to all of our coaches, but we I actually keep track of every single head coach when they're expiring, when they're due, and I email them saying, hey, yours is expiring in two months. Another class is coming up, so we do keep track of our head coaches. Um, that does keep, majority of our coaches are head coaches, is what I'm trying to say. So there's always someone there. And to your athletic um, trainer question, we always have someone on campus. Um, so whether you might be on the far grass field, but someone's at Hornet Stadium, so they're 100 yards away or something, but they are present. We have a gator for outside, so they can get around quickly, so they're not just running for an emergency. Um, and inside, it's right by the main gym um, for the high school of where they're located inside too. So when you talk about away events, that's on the. Sometimes our trainer does travel for those collision sports that we know are going to provide a lot more more likely contact. Um, or if there's nothing else going on, they just happen to be like, "Oh, I'm going to go watch swim today." We don't expect swim to collide, um, but you know, versus football, soccer, gymnastics, cheer. You know, when you're doing all the stunting, um, those bigger ones that are more likely for injury. But other schools also have athletic trainers on site as well, even though they're not ours. They're there to serve student athletes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then let me see. I guess this is one big question. Um, so I know that you all track, um, which is great, um, the grades um, and where students can't participate. Um, and I went through the um, handbook, the athletic a- athletic handbook, um, and was pleased to see that there was um, a component of discipline. Um, and when discipline comes from the school, that that will carry over to um, the sport. And um, I guess I'm curious as well um, if there's athletic um, component and things going on, does that get communicated to the school? So I guess my big question is, um, is there that great communication going on um, as it is with the you know, the grades and checking that and, you know, making sure um, those behaviors and everything um, are, you know, yeah, being consistent. And then uh, in, in addition, um, if there is hate speech um, or, um, you know, uh, comments going on um, specifically, I guess, with, with amongst the sports and, um, if that's, you know, 
not just that one student, but harm caused to possibly, you know, um, more athletes. Um, I know you ha all haven't did the DEI um, a, uh, training um, recently, but I'm wondering how that's kind of handled as well. So to your question, um, yes, I don't want to say I have them on speed dial, but I do have the principals in my phone for when we have issues off campus or with our own. So to your point where if a student gets suspended during the day, that does affect their after school activities as soon as we get notified as well. Um, and we are notified by the high school and middle school. They have their own documents that they send us. Um, so once they put it in the system, we get notified so we can tell our coaches, hey, they're not playing today, they're not practicing today, whatever it may be and vice versa. Um, if we have a situation at the middle school or the high school where they're misbehaving, that does, we notify the principal because there might be school consequences on top of um, team consequences. It might be you're missing your next event, it might be suspension from the team, it might be expulsion from the team, it kind of escalates versus how many, just very similar to um, the student handbook for the middle school and the high school where it can escalate based on, you mentioned hate speech or bullying or fighting, all these different levels of, did we catch you with a vape? Did we you know, all these, um, so there's no set specific, but we work with Kim Jasper, Lindsay, Musetta, James, Teresa, very easily and very well um, for those situations where it's uh, a combo, so to speak, where it's not just school or not just athletics, especially when they're in season versus maybe out of season where we don't have, if I expel you from the team, you're not even in season, it's not really a consequence, but there's still school consequences that can be upheld. Great. Yep. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yep. I, I want to more highlight one thing and make sure that I think we're going to be in agreement on this. Uh, I talked about the tremendous value that I think our student athletes get for, for their money. I believe we've done some benchmarking as well to see where we are with regards to our peers around us. Is that correct? I mean, so. What kind of numbers are we benchmark? I mean, like on our pay to participate fees. Yes. Yes. Right? So I guess I wanted to give you a chance to like highlight that because if I recall, we're pretty, on average, if not a little below some other places. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I don't remember specifics, but we have talked to other SEC schools, um, and a couple in the SEC um, charge per sport. So Dexter, for example, $250 per sport. I do know that there is a family upper limit that they would set for that, because if you have multiple kids in multiple sports, you're talking a lot, a lot of money. Um, some of the others, Northville and Novi, we often compare to. Northville does it annually, $385. Novi is $175 per sport. Per sport. Um, Ann Arbor Public Schools is $265 per year, so we're a little more expensive than that. Although we have learned as far as some of the things we're able to provide that some of the Ann Arbor schools are not, such as game workers and things like that, uh, we're, we're lucky in that regard. Um, the flip side, Chelsea does not have a pay to participate fee, um, but in talking to their sports uh, administrators, uh, they struggle in terms of ticket takers, game workers, security, and things like that. They rely on volunteers. And so you can imagine as parents how many times you ask to do something in our situation, now extrapolate that with a no fee like Chelsea does. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for highlighting that. I just wanted to give a chance. I knew we had done that, so thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> For those who didn't thank hear, you. Dr. Gold is showing her appreciation by not asking any questions. Have dinner before but I'd like nine, to thank you like all this. very, very much for your presentation this evening. I fired off one question via email, thank and uh, see you uh, next February. All right. If not do. at a sporting event of some sort. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Lotch is up next. On an under discussion, we want to talk about schools of choice. Okay, yes. You want to do it from the table here? or Okay. Uh, from, it's fine. Versus okay. go up there? Um, okay, I'll go up there. Ron, I'm, they just seem like I don't usually do that, but okay. Uh, okay, so I put a new uh, handout for anybody who was, we, we talked a little bit about this a policy, uh, some other uh, matter, but uh, there's a new handout that discusses um, the openings available or the proposed openings in 24 25 and so i just wanted to talk about philosophy with this and and that is that um, that we would focus more on the earliest grade levels in terms of most of the students that we would take would come in at young fives in kindergarten with a few um, 
a first, second, and third grade openings, and then not take students in school of choice in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and then open it back up again in high school, primarily for um, you know schools like Emerson that there's you know not necessarily another option for students, and they may be looking for a high school option. So in other words, the focus would be more the early grade levels. Um, and then also open it up again for some students to come in at the high school level. So that's the general philosophy for next year. Um, and when you see it saying minimum openings, th this is a little bit confusing in that it basically means that at young fives, it says 10. So if there were 14 students that applied, you would need to be take the minimum of 10. Uh, that's more or less what that means. And anytime you see it say one minimum opening, it means that if you had 14 students apply for that grade level, you would have to take one. Um, that, that's what that generally means. And so when you get to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, we would have to um, specify that minimum openings of zero means that we would not be taking students in grades four, five, six, seven, and eight for the next school year. So that's the gist of that. Questions? I mean, well, that's what we're that's what we're proposing. Kim. Yeah. So, um, short four months ago, we kind of had this conversation when we talked about five one, policy five one one three and the strive for ten percent. From my understanding, what I see is um, we have 35 or 36. Did you clarify that, Steve, that we're dropping off that are seniors right now that are going to be falling out? Yeah, there's, uh, I believe, because uh, Miranda provided some good documentation, 36 that will be graduating. That'll be graduating. And so then we'll have a minimum of 50 with this policy. So so our strive is going from like a 5 point or 10.5 or 10.6 10 to closer to 11%. Seems like that's going in the wrong direction. Um, well, that would that would be based on that a percentage. Yeah, I, I, again, we're trying to state that we feel like we should be in that ten percent range, but I want to try to focus on the youngest grade levels. If this board felt like we needed to move all these minimum openings and change those numbers, we could do that, but I'm recommending this to be the range that we take. Sure. So um, I want to I want to reiterate my support for that, okay? So we looked at this also as a as a finance team. First of all, I want you to I want you to know that I 100% support Dr. Lotch's philosophy about prioritizing our youngest learners. And the biggest reason why for me that's a priority and reason why I find that to be wise is because I believe in the quality of our staff. And so if we are obtaining students at four and five years old, those are individuals who are going through our programs with our staff members and our program, you know, like, and, and our targeted interventions and our MTSS model and those kinds of things. And I believe in that. And so I actually believe that there is um, tremendous value in that. Uh, the, you know, the, I asked Dr. Lotch to, to tell us, when, when I thought about like this 10% thing, and I like the idea of strive for 10%, but I also want us to, if there's only two ways that I can think of that we can really, really generate revenue, and they are per pupil allowance, which we have no say in whatsoever, right? and student count. And so if we want to run high, high level programs and we want to not have to make decisions about things like, for example, we had mentioned it, I think it's not, so please public, but like things like we would have had to consider you know, semesters instead of trimesters, or you know, maybe sometimes you have to like cut this program or that program. And I guess for me, when I look at our surroundings, I asked Dr. Lotch about who has um, you know this cap idea? The caps were things like Ann Arbor, like near twenty percent 
Um, you know, Lincoln, am I, like, please, like, if, if you want to speak to it, like, you, you wrote to me, and I'm telling you that, like, if we are at 11%, but it preserves our programs, it preserves the quality of what we're doing, then I support taking this many students. Yeah, I did, I did ask other superintendents about caps. Ann Arbor said that they don't have an official cap, cap but they try, to, they try to stay below 20%. Chelsea does have a 10% cap. Uh, Dexter's unlimited, Milan's unlimited, Lincoln's unlimited. Um, those are the ones I looked at. Like, they don't have a cap in those other districts. So, so I guess what I would it. say is to back that up is I say, would say that I trust our superintendent and our plan, our plan to reduce by attrition a million dollars from our budget, which will, will help to, to, to take our budget and, and, and level it out. And, but I, I think we need to take students too in order to be able to support a 115 member marching band and some of those kinds of things. And, and we wanna have those robust quality, huge, big programs, then I think this is, then I guess I'd rather see our superintendent take 10.7 than 10.2. Uh, anyway, that, that's my one trustee's thoughts. Susan? Um, so the policy uh, 5113 um, that the board made a decision as a whole um, to support, um, you know, it, it's the superintendent striving to enroll out of district students at approximately 10%. Um, I think if we do get 11%, um, that's approximate to me. Um, so yeah, I think you know you're still looking at that number and talking to different districts and um, keeping that in mind. Um, so yeah, I I think this looks good to me. From another trustee. Thank you. Well, we're not voting on this this evening by any means, but I appreciate the information. Is there any other any other questions you want to raise at this point? No. Okay. Uh, in the we're moving on then. In the absence of. Uh, uh, policy committee chair Jennifer Miller being ill this evening I have a she, she's left me with some notes to share so I'm going to provide a very brief update of the last two meetings Mike feels a little hot tonight sir oh good all right it's just me it's my ears are ringing um, on February 21st, we had a policy meeting to review the suggested NEOLA updates, and you'll see these in the consent agenda. Uh, these are related to laws that were changed regarding the Public Employment Relations Act, what we call PARA. Uh, Carol Diglio joined the committee meeting because these changes are connected to her role as the Director of uh, Human Resources. Uh, we discussed changes to the five policies that would be in alignment to the changes to the law, and these are all strongly recommended by NEOLA. Uh, the first is board powers, and you'll see that uh, basically this relates to a number of topics that are no longer prohibited subjects. They've been deleted from this bylaw. Uh, and these changes uh, took place on February 13th. Uh, and the next one is uh, policy, that was policy 0122. Policy 1420, school administrator evaluation. The major change there is, is that the statute, which goes into effect July 1st, basically changes the evaluation scales for educators and it'll move from four columns to three. So now effectively we'll, we will have effective, developing, and needs improvement. Policy 31, and again, this is all by the law. Um, so anyway, uh, policy 3131, staff reductions and recalls. Uh, this policy relates to staff reduc reductions and recalls which are no longer a prohibited subject of bargaining. The legislature amended section 1248 relating to what can be used as a decision-making factor in staffing situations. Additionally, prospective changes to the rating system are going to affect July 1st. So the same rating for superintendents is this rating for uh, staff for teachers. Probationary teachers also, policy 3142. Uh, there's a rating change for those uh, people as well. And uh, this policy basically reflects, reflects that. And finally, in the consent agenda, policy 3220, professional staff evaluations. Senate bills 395 and 396 were signed into law by Governor Whitmer. These bills changed the evaluation system effective July 1st, 2024. 
And uh, you'll see that in the red marks and the green marks. Most of the red marks are basically the slash outs of the uh, prior to July 1st and the rest are either reiterated in green or noted. So I'll leave that at that. And I would like to also talk about tonight, this evening's policy <coughs> committee. We looked at four policies in particular. I'm gonna run through them really quickly because they are going to show up again. Uh, policy 5113 will be up for discussion in um, March 12th, our next board meeting. Uh, this regards a slight change of language to our the very policy we were talking about this evening, 5113 Schools of Choice program. Um, basically, we're just becoming more aligned with the law as it exists, and it's remarkable how a single word can make a difference, and we'll have a great discussion about that next week. Uh, March 12th also, we will put two uh, policies on the consent agenda. The uh, policy 8400, uh, which is a school safety information, which just clarifies and tightens a number of pieces of language and uh, designates the director of operations as a liaison to work with the school safety commission. Um, try to see if there's anything else there. No, not major. Uh, in addition to something that's going on the consent agenda, and I would urge you all to read this, is the use of five, policy 5512, use of tobacco by students. This policy greatly, it's not just tobacco, but also nicotine-related products, and uh, there are so many of them. It just, it, with the changes in technology, the language now is far more precise in this uh, policy and uh, basically covers all, all manner of things that you can imagine ways students get nicotine into their bodies these days. Um, and there are also uh, policies that were reiterated on advertisement and promotion of uh, tobacco, nicotine, signage. Again, clarification of language is all the way through this, as well as enforcement. And finally, we will have for discussion next week, uh, the next board meeting, uh, a policy 8300, if you want to take a peek at that at some point. It's the uh, con continuity of organizational operations plans. In case of a disaster, what happens, who takes over, what organizations, uh, and what sh staff members and administrators are, are run the show, in effect. And... Um, that, in a nutshell, is our was our policy committee meeting, which, thank you very much, Jennifer Stebbin, for her first policy committee in five years. Nice to have you on board. And uh, we got out at 5.35, which, um, which was uh, startling to me. We <laughs> so <laughs> made me double check my watch to see. Uh, so we, um, we have administrative board updates at this point. I'm gonna start with Dr. Lodge, then go to the students. Uh, oh, oh, I me. Have oh, oh, I'm sorry, we questions. have- Questions, it's yes. a discussion. Item, right? This is a discussion about the policy committee, yes. Yes. Um, so you mentioned a word change um, in the policy 5113. Yes. Which is related to school of choice, correct? It, it is the school's of choice policy. Yes. Okay. Well, well, Would you like me to go, go into detail that, about that? I guess impact when we, because this will come up on the next agenda, so will that have any sort of impact Probably not, but I'm happy to just speak for a minute about that word change, if that's okay. Um, the, in the, our policy has said that the superintendent is not, or sorry, that schools, that Celine is not available to any non-resident student who has been suspended within the preceding two years. Uh, practice has been that in some cases, uh, the superintendent has, with in great consultation with the parents and the students and seeing the situation, has allowed that student to come in. Um, we've noticed that that was a, a difference in our policy. When we actually looked at the law, it turns out that the superintendent, our superintendent, has been doing it exactly correctly according to the law. It is, so the word is changed from is to may. Enrollment may not be available to any non-resident who has been suspended within the last two years. So that's basically the policy change, and it, it just keeps us in line with what we've been doing anyway. Turns out we were doing it according to the law. Our policy was a little out of whack. That's awesome. Thanks. That's it. Great. And, and can I ask if the other policy uh, committee members have anything to add? I don't, but um, I appreciate Michael stepping in and being a good teammate when um, Jenny was out ill tonight, so thank you. Super, thank you.
so administrative uh, or board updates, please. Uh, we start with Steve, then the students, and then work away from Austin Gerby, Stephanie Stepagold. Okay, yeah, so excited about Inclusion Week. We've had some great activities already. It was crazy sock day today, and then tomorrow, Polar Plunge, 1015. Michael's getting ready to be freezing for a reason, and that is not fun. I've done it before. This, this should be good. Yeah, but I, I don't care how warm it is out. That'll be great. Okay, we, we shall see, but we're looking forward to it. Um, the other thing coming up the, uh, this Thursday night I'm excited about, I'm going to Wharton Center with uh, Dave Meller because one of our students, Addie Nabeck, won the state FFA for beef production and diversified livestock. So I'll be on the stage at Wharton to see her and her family accept that award. So that's exciting. And then also a few events coming up. Uh, I'm encouraging people to um, join me and, and my wife, Laura, at the Foundation for Salinary Schools Blue Jeans and Bling on March 9th. And then, of course, get your tickets for Beauty and the Beast for March 15th to 17th. That's going to be a great show. Um, based off what we talked about today and having um, the AD talk about athletics, I also wanted to talk about the student showcase that was supposed to happen tonight. So it was supposed to be the Washtenaw United team. Uh, the girls hockey team reached out and was super excited to talk about their successes. Unfortunately, the coach was not happy with the progress on getting them letters and receiving recognition for that. So they're looking forward to coming back um, when they get more recognition and like the varsity letter process um, comes back up to discussion. So I'm excited to talk and advocate about that. So thank you. Thank you. And um, along with sports, hockey unfortunately came to an end, but we did win back to back to back SEC titles, which is one of the first time in a long time, I think, maybe one of the first. And along with Inclusion Week, yesterday we had a unified student versus staff basketball game, and Dr. Lotch was a ref, and it was a lot of fun. It seemed like the entire school was into it, and the students beat the staff, as always, so it was perfect. <laughs> of course, it was just by a very slim margin, right? <laughs> That's true, but we won, so that's all that matters. <laughs> and with the polar plunge coming up, I'm excited to see everybody jump along with President McVeigh. And after, I have shirts for everyone on the board to wear it tomorrow for the polar plunge. Um, Thursday, I... Uh, Went to an event uh, Thursday night at the um, high school. The uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes had an event uh, there. Um, the leadership team put a lot of work together and uh, brought in Donovan Edwards, the running back from the University of Michigan, and he kind of gave his um, story of life and then his faith and how that has helped him through adversity. And there was a lot of parents and a lot of kids there. Um, and so I thought that was just a great event for um, uh, t to hear Donovan's story. I mean, it was a really good story, and um, it was good for all the other kids to hear that too, and how how, their, how his faith has uh, helped him through uh, adversities. I just have one quick item. I've talked a lot tonight, but um, there is something that came across my radar that I wanted to highlight. And um, February twenty eighth tomorrow, in addition to to Polar Plunge, I I saw a potty training workshop that is being offered here um, for those with and without special needs of all ages. It's gonna be in this Liberty boardroom. It's done by our SEAC team. So there's a number of people who are experts in that area. And so I would want to just promote and highlight that. And again, tomorrow that's happening here at 9.30 in this boardroom. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Steve mentioned blue jeans and bling, so I'll just mention that as well. There's still time to buy tickets if you'd like. Uh, as Jenny mentioned last time, you can also participate in the auction if you are so able and interested. And I look forward to seeing Lauren's bling and Steve's bling and Laura Lodge's bling um, on the 9th. So we'll see you there. 
Um, at the high school, I know our students are ending try two and getting ready for finals. So best of luck to the two of you and to all of our high school students. And also, um, we are going through scheduling right now at the high school and um, seeing our Hornet Nation folks, our video production team, it, it just really reminded me about the breadth of choices that we have at the high school and how you really can't, um, you know, help but be grateful for those um, excellent choices that our high school students are given. Um, a lot of opportunity to find a lot of passions that they might pursue in life. So love that. Um, Friday starts March is reading month. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity, depending on the age of your children, to read to your children or to involve them in, in a lifelong love of reading. I know there's a couple teachers on here that probably would mention that as well. Um, and then personally, um, the HR report was part of our packet, and I just wanted to personally um, thank and um, wish Joe Welton the very best of luck in any endeavor he, he <laughs> may have in his life. Once a Hornet, always a Hornet, Joe, but um, he was one of the very first staff members that my family met when we started in Saline Area Schools and um, provided an excellent foundation. Um, and, and to this day, um, remembers the kids that he started with when he was a gym teacher at Pleasant Ridge and is just very, very involved in student life. So I wanted to thank him from the bottom of my heart. Okay. Um, so tonight was the Sex Ed Advisory Board um, meeting um, at 5.30. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't able to make it and um, the other co-chair wasn't. Um, I know that it's a board committee, so hopefully um, we'll communicate about different uh, time frames, um, but um, hopefully we can provide an update um, soon uh, when talking to uh, the chair. Um, the DEI advisory committee meeting is this Thursday. Um, let me think. I had something else, huh? Wednesday, tomorrow. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, that is tomorrow. Um, thanks, uh, Kara, for uh, mentioning that. Um, and then, oh, what was I gonna say? Oh, I was happy I reached out to each of my um, younger uh, teachers, uh, sorry, my younger children's teachers, and, um, asked the question about uh, what they were doing for Black History Month, and uh, which I knew some of the answers because my um, uh, multiracial daughter um, came home and was, you know, she was like, oh, that's all we talk about. <laughs> so I was like, okay, great. Um, so she's like, oh, we've talked about so many, and there's posters and, you know, um, uh, uh, all of these, you know, black people in, in history, and, um, and so that was pretty exciting. And then even my, my um, youngest and young fives had said, um, and she's black, um, she had said uh, they, they were talking about um, like a uh, postal worker and, um, you know, just within uh, what they were already uh, within that lesson. And, you know, she was like, oh yeah, Philip. <laughs> so you know, she, like so, so that was really great um, to hear back from them that they are, um, you know, incorporating lessons now, um, celebrating and recognizing, and also um, you know incorporating it throughout the year. So um, I was very pleased um, with that that response. And you know, I know sometimes when I volunteer in the classrooms, I do um, see you know um, people who. You know, children who look like them in pictures and, um, you know, Woodland Meadows uh, does a wonderful job of putting up displays and things like that um, for particular um, months uh, for celebrating. And so I appreciate that. Um, one last thing. Um, I did want to, um, I guess, uh, mention, um, bring awareness to um, the student from Oklahoma, uh, Nex Benedict, um, who was a transgender student um, who was bullied and harmed, um, well, was attacked in a restroom um, and uh, passed away the next day. Um, and I know there's some unknown, uh, 
you know, things related to that death. But, um, you know, one thing was that bullying had occurred um, consistently um, and wasn't handled um, for them being uh, transgender, non-binary. Um, and so uh, the school um, didn't handle it in uh, even the incident in, in a good way at all. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, remind our students that um, we do have policies. Um, and so one of those is 5517.02, which is transgender and non-binary students. Um, and then there's the anti-harassment, uh, 5517, um, discrimination based on sex, um, includes gender identity as well. Um, so, so, you know, uh, make sure that you know that you have protections under that. Um, and then also uh, 5517.01, which is bullying and other aggressive behavior towards students. Um, and so I just want to um, know that, that, that there are those resources. Um, I know, um, you know, there's um, the Trevor Hotline um, for, you know, talking about these issues, um, somebody to talk to. Um, and, you know, I know it's a really difficult time um, for those in the LGBTQ community. And um, I just wanted to, to recognize that and um, say that I, I support our students um, and hopefully things are addressed um, and do not continue um, through to, to make sure that there's a safe and supportive environment for all of our students. Thank you. Um, when we were listening to uh, Assistant Superintendent Osley's budget, I just wanted to take a minute to thank um, the taxpayers, government, Governor Whitmer, the state legislatures for increasing the per pupil allowance um, on a day of an election. Um, I think it's just important to uh, note that elections matter and, um, you know, that was a really great investment in our students throughout the state. And I'm looking forward to some of the investments in pre-K that are coming and I'm grateful that we have lunches for our kids. And so uh, that's excellent. And I'd like to thank our civics and government uh, teachers who are out there teaching our students to be good citizens. And hopefully we maybe had some 18 year olds eligible this year who went and uh, exercised their right to vote today. Um, and then I have not been to as many events as I would like to go to, but I'm hoping for more this spring. But I did want to highlight that almost every week uh, I get some sort of message, uh, both as a parent and as a board member, about um, our emergency response teams uh, handling student events. And I would just like to thank those people. Um, I know some of them. I don't know all of them. But I, um, I know that some of those incidences turn out to be not a big deal and others have turned out to be a very big deal and being the person who gets that call is not easy and uh, I know that they're handling it with professionalism and grace and compassion and I'm just every time I get one of those I realize that behind that sort of boilerplate message there was a terrified parent and a scared student and a health emergency and so I just like to publicly thank uh, those teams and uh, our school nursing staff for doing those trainings and keeping us up to date. Um, so I want to mention that. Awesome, thank you. I'll just do the anchor leg here. I appreciate that, Lauren. Um, I'm furthering my explorations in artificial intelligence by taking a course this week, uh, which is which run through a General Motors. I'm going to be a Semla quiz bowl reader on March 9th, and you all are welcome to visit. Your kids are in that one? No? All right. Uh, and regarding two separate tanks, uh, one that doesn't have sharks, uh, the polar plunge is tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be brisk, but, you know, more like a spa. Brad, I appreciate the, uh, the funding. Uh, he did say in his note, may I share, that he really hoped it would be extra polary tomorrow, but I'm not sure it's going to be that way. 
Finally, I'm, I'm very pleased and delighted to be a, a, a part of the Shark Tank for Mrs. Stuckey's class. Uh, her uh, the biological... Uh, Stuckey. Stuckey, I'm sorry, what did I say? Stuckey? Stuckey? It's Suki. It's Suki, yeah. thank you. Well, uh, biomedical advancements or ideas, and I'm looking forward to being, uh, being able to venture fund millions of dollars for some up and coming brilliant idea. Actually, last year's were pretty amazing, so if you get a chance to drop in at some point, please uh, volunteer when it comes around you'll, again. Um, you'll be doing it with me, and my uh, kiddo is in class. Oh, you're going to be there? Yeah. I'm on, there's March 4th and March 5th. What's your date? Um, I, I told her I'd be there. Oh, okay. I have to do only March 5th. March 5th as well. All right, good. Well, good. We'll see some of you there then. Thank you. Um, we're at the uh, consent agenda part of the uh, ag <coughs> agenda. The consent agenda is listed in this agenda and will not be read aloud. The motion noted will allow for the authorization of all listed items without discussion unless a member of the board requests that anyone or all be considered individually. Do I have a, a motion to authorize the consent agenda as printed? So moved, Stubbin. Devin. Any support? Support. Yes, step. Thank you, Susan. Yes, step. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Um, items on the next agenda, Mr. Latch, Superintendent Latch. Uh, yes, we'll have a DEIAC report and a community education report. And then we're also going to do the uh, first quarterly superintendent evaluation review in closed session. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, the next board meeting will be held on um, Tuesday, March 12th at 6.30. Uh, we are, I'd like to entertain a motion to enter into closed session of the Board Ed of Education meeting at 8.36. Well, actually, we'll be there at probably about 8, 8.40. Uh, with the intent of reopening at, how long will we take, uh, Carol? Half hour. Half an hour? 20 minutes? Okay, we'll see you in uh, 9 ish nine ish we'll see uh, for the purpose of collective bargaining 8c of the open meetings act under 8c a simple majority vote is sufficient to enter into closed session do we have a motion please so move Stubbin. Stubbin. is that tim. tim thank you tim is seconding all in favor please say aye aye, aye. thank you um opposed no opposed so we will see you in closed session we'll move out the people in the audience who shouldn't be here any longer and thank you very much for staying Zach and students
Thank you very much. We, uh, without objection, I would like to adjourn the regular Board of Education meeting of February 27th, 2024 at 9.32. Thank you. Oh, now it's official. Thank you, everyone. See you in a...